Hello, friends. Welcome to Pod Maverick. That is not the right banner on the show. Welcome to Pod Maverick After Dark. I'm Kirk Henderson, and you're joined, as always, by myself and Josh Bow. We are editors over at MavsMoneyBall.com. Thank you so much for hanging out with us after this game. It is right after midnight. It's technically Saturday here in the Central Time Zone. The Dallas Mavericks just defeated the Sacramento Kings for the second time in a row. This time, 107 to 103. Josh, how are you? I'm doing good. How do you feel about the 2024 NBA champion Dallas Mavericks? Team? I mean, <laughs> this is kind of one of them games where this was the ugliest game they've ever won in the Luka Doncic Kyrie era. This was the ugliest game they've ever won, in my opinion. Um, and I, I, I was... Like my heart was kind of in my throat for a significant portion of this game because the Mavericks just couldn't get over the hump. They just couldn't after a pretty rough defensive first quarter and some like really awful misses. It, it really felt like this was going to be one where we were just going to be mad, like one that they should have should have gotten somehow, some way. And then they won the game somehow, <laughs> some way. And I'm still sort of trying to figure out how because the box score is stupid like if i was a king's fan um i would be really pissed You'd be throwing up <laughs> i'd be really really pissed because sabonis was ass but also got bodied a ton the maverick shot three times as many free throws as the kings that's mm -hmm. wild mm -hmm. uh, and and what's crazy is i'm trying to really understand how because i felt like the physicality in this game was very even like the kings gave it just as much as the mavericks did and I honestly don't remember 33 free throw attempts. I guess Kyrie shot a number in the fourth quarter, which really helped kind of yeah. boost that number. I mean, Luca had 14 on his own. So yeah. <laughs> like, and he, oh, and he missed so damn many. Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of where they all came from. But yeah, I mean, that's a crazy win. Um, I think if you're kind of looking at, I mean, obviously Mavs fans want every game, but if you're kind of looking at it detached, you know, you kind of take the split, right? Like you would, I don't think anyone would be too upset. I mean, right. outside of fan emotion, if you didn't get both games, like a split was totally a reasonable outcome. And then they take both of them and they do it in a way where it felt like they kind of just broke the King's souls in that second half, like absolutely wore them down in a way that a Luka Doncic Mavericks team doesn't really do all that often. Um, they did end up making threes, which is funny, but they weren't making threes for most of the game. But this just followed the trend. This is what they've been doing for the last 10, 11, 12 games. They're going to, their defense is going to give you some threes. And yep. Fox walked into some pull up threes. Keon Ellis got some open threes. Keegan Murray got a couple open threes. But they're not giving you the paint and they're not giving you the rim. And they're just, you're not scoring inside the three point line, basically, is kind of what their d defensive philosophy is. Like, yeah, maybe we overhelp, maybe we shade a little bit too much and we're going to give up a backside three or a weak side corner three or or a, or a kick out wing three. But you're not scoring at the rim. Like, you're just not. And the Kings shot 12 of 26 in the restricted area and they shot 9 of 25 in the paint outside the restricted area. And when you consider how good Sabonis is, how, when you consider how good De'Aaron Fox is in, the, in that floater range, like, this was a defensive clinic these last two games. I mean, it really was. I mean, I know the Kings started off hot, um, but that's kind of be expected. Like, they were embarrassed on Tuesday night. Like, you got to expect that they're going to show some pride. They're not a bad team. No, they're a great but, team. Yeah, the Mavericks wore them down. Like, they just wore them down. Like, they just wouldn't let them get comfortable inside the three-point line. And you kind of – the Kings shot well from three, 47%, but they basically – Yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about that. The fact yeah. that they – they survive that is kind of bananas. Yeah, and they survive it because they don't give up anything easy and they don't give up anything else. I mean, easy, you know, they do give up some easy threes, but they've – three is worth more than two, and it's not great to give up as many open threes as Mavericks do. But if they're going to be this good guarding the paint, which, you know, a layup is the best shot in basketball, like an open right. layup. As much as three is greater than two, like the greatest shot in basketball is an open shot right around the rim. So – 
if they're going to give a, if they're going to basically lock those down and with Gafford and Lively basically playing 48 minutes and with Exum and with Derek Jones Jr. both healthy and playing like they kind of have the horses to do this like I don't think this is smoke and mirrors like I think this is sustainable it's it's truly crazy I mean you're you're looking at who, who hit the threes tonight for the Kings uh, Murray who's a heck of a basketball player he, he's kind of like a he'd be a fantastic finishing piece in this Mavericks team uh was four, four or seven from deep he missed all of his two pointers which yes. is, is you right. know that's the thing you pointed out um Fox hit three three pointers Keon Ellis hit four of nine Kessler Edwards was three of three uh I thought the Mavericks in the second quarter and on maybe the second half really stopped giving like Sabonis no, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to do my Sabonis thing now. Dude, you um, got fired up earlier. Uh-huh. Sabonis is a dirty fucking cheap shot artist who does the KG screening shit where he's just spinning around like a turnstile, throwing his elbows, throwing his ass, throwing his shoulders, making the very smart bet that the refs aren't going to call fouls. And how that relates to the three pointers that the Kings were getting off is Luca was more or less letting, he was kind of it was almost like a soft switch for a moment where he would sort of grab on to Sabonis, go under it, and then let Keon Ellis shoot the three. I was about to lose my mind with Luca in the first quarter because it's just like, dude, like play a little defense. And in the second half beyond, the Mavericks stopped letting that crap happen from the top of the key. Um, and that was much more helpful to to at least the star players like when Kessler Edwards um shout out Pepperdine's own Kessler Edwards <laughs> pretty good player um hit three of three I think he hit them all in the fourth quarter those are the ones that you live with you know when when Murray's like when the when the starters are drilling threes and you're just not closing out that was pissing me off um but this this was just one of those those games where uh the, the Mavericks matched defensive physicality Um, and that's just not a thing I'm used to saying it's going to take me a while to get (laughs) used to how physical this Mavericks team plays. It's really something. Yeah. And I mean, it's really, I mean, it's the trade deadline. I mean, Mm -hmm. they finally got size. I mean, they've, you know, lively is no longer a man on an Island in the paint. Um, you can finally rotate in Gafford and lively together. So you never have to play small if you don't want to. I mean, they can tactically, they can still go to Maxi at the five, but they really haven't they needed haven't, to no. lately. Uh, and Pete, like PJ at the four, his offense is really bad. Like, I'm not gonna not gonna sugarcoat it. But his arms but, are everywhere yeah, on defense. He his length and size defensively just mm. makes such a difference. And I know the Mavericks, you know, Dorian at the four was kind of the last time they had that. But even then, Dorian at the four, like. Dorian was a three to me uh, that they asked to guard fours. Um, and he did the best that he could. Like PJ mm-hmm. feels more like strength wise, size wise, length wise. Like he is, he is a more legitimate like four man defensively. I feel like, um, and the way he's able to like tags roll men that are bigger than hit, like a Sabonis, like how many mm-hmm. times did he, cover up Sabonis on the weak side rotation because Gafford or Lively is maybe, you know, contesting um, like Fox or whoever the ball handler is in the mid range. And then they try to, you know, they, then PJ kind of has to dive down onto Sabonis. And it's like, it, it was an advantage. Like Sabonis on PJ was not an advantage for the Kings. And that's a testament to PJ's buy-in on the defensive end. Cause he's always had the tools, but like he was just, he was not doing this in Charlotte. Um, yeah outside of like certain moments so like he really he like him and jones and exum like gafford and lively get a lot of the headlines defensively because they get so many blocks and they're and they're and because they've been that good they're not trying to take anything away from them they've been incredible uh but like what makes them able to do their jobs and be able to play that drop coverage is you need you need perimeter players that can chase ball handlers around a screen which Jones and Exum have been doing. And you need that swing forward defensively that can help rotate and crash down in the paint. And so your low man isn't like a six, four guy that's getting scored on over and over again. Like the fact that, you know, how many times have we seen, you know, last season where the Mavericks were getting just 
brutalized in the paint because like Luca was asked to be the second tallest guy on the floor. And sometimes player, you know, teams would get them into rotation and the low man rotating to help at the rim would be like a guard like Theo Penson or, Mm -hmm. you know, who was the McKinley, the two way guard. Like, you know, you just have these outrageous moments where you got these small guys crashing down in the paint to guard because they just played these small lineups with Gafford, with Jones, with Washington, Exum, like the only small player on the court most of the time is Kyrie and Kyrie, how, you know, he gets beat a couple times, but if you can live with Kyrie being your smallest guy on the floor, and I think you're just kind of seeing that in effect right now. Well, yeah, and we're 11 minutes into the game, and we've not even said like Kyrie's name that much. Which and he was, saved the game. Like man. two things were. Dude. <laughs> the fourth quarter was two things. Um, yeah. The first was it, and I wrote about this in the recap. Uh, I think it was Ellis hit a three at the nine minute mark of the fourth quarter. The Kings were up 92 to 82, so the Mavericks were down 10 with nine minutes. Over the next nine minutes of basketball, the Kings only scored 11 points. Kyrie went on a one-man run, scoring 14 points, I think, from essentially that point on. Um, He was involved in five out of every six plays in the Mavericks offense. The Kings just sent hard blitzes at Luka all night long, and they're actually pretty effective. And Kyrie was really, really, really good in that Order. Um, yeah, fourteen points. Didn't miss a shot. Four of four mm. from the field. Two of two from three. Four. Of he five missed a free three. throw, which was hilarious. <laughs> like the man is. I think he'd made like ninety-one in a row at that point. Yeah, he's so. close. I mean, he's not that far. I mean, he's not going to get it because it's too late. But he's been flirting with a fifty, forty, ninety season uh, this year. Um, he's at forty-nine point four, forty-one from three, mm-hmm. ninety point two. On the free throw line, so yeah, his shooting has been—I mean, his shooting has been incredible, and it was—and it was on display in the fourth. And again, like his two threes weren't easy threes. No, nope. like it was the pull-up transition three, which feels like. See, I think that shot. one's an that easy one's, one. Yeah, that one's that's probably, he's the most look easy. <laughs> well, it's it's just such a great shot because the person who used to do it the most, and the Mavericks hadn't had anybody like this in a long time. I guess Monte Ellis kind of it. He he preferred he wasn't the long three too. Guy. Yeah. Um, Jason Terry. Terry I mean, yeah. it, it was it's very Jason Terry and the Mavericks. That Mavericks team never ran like this team, so it's just it's really fun to watch Kyrie doing that. Like I'm pretty sure Kyrie is shooting something like 44 percent on that on those shots. Like it's something absolutely bonkers. Um, and and you just don't. Like I love it. I love the shot. I, I I would much prefer that than seeing Tim Hardaway Jr. shoot ever again at this point. I just I don't know. I'm I'm well, don't go there yet. Let's talk a little more about what no, no, no. I'm just yeah. saying it's like like Kyrie was just he was so important to that to that quarter because Luca was just I I mean he was on the Mavericks, the Mavericks are gonna have to consider sitting Luca at some point with how banged up he looks. Because he was. I mean, like he bled through his knee pad, and Nick Angstad pointed out they didn't bandage his knee no, they just wrapped um, it or they wrapped, they it wrapped up. his knee up yeah yeah so. uh, Ky- Kyrie's shooting now this doesn't include transition but he overall he's shooting 39.4 percent on pull right. threes which is really good considering he takes almost four of them per game um so that's really good and then yeah and then his other three was like a stare down like face up three after taking a couple of jab steps like it's not like he just had catch and shoot shots um he made some great shots, and yeah, the Kings. It makes it's kind of funny because post pre pre trade deadline, it felt like doubling Luca and getting the ball out of his hands that way was like the dumbest defensive strategy you could do, because it's like why would you give these limited players air like you know why would you make their lives easier, like and we saw when they lost five of six teams were like, what if we just guarded Luca one on one and we didn't let these role players get open shots and let's see what happens. And Luca was scoring like 40 points a game and everyone else was doing nothing and they lost five of six. And I was like, why did, you know, and some teams have kind of stopped doing that. Some of that's regular season because teams just don't scout regular season like they would if it was a playoff series, which is understandable. There's 82 games. You can't, you can't get film sessions and tape and practice time and before all these games to kind of go over what you want to do defensively. But I also think like these guys were like PJ and, and Tim and these guys were missing so many shots that they were probably like, all right, screw it. Let's just go back to doubling Luca because PJ is shooting like 28% from three. Tim's shooting like 20% from three since the trade deadline or, or the all-star break or whatever yep. it is. 
Like it's almost like the role players have shot so poorly. Like Maxie's not shooting well, although he made two huge threes uh, tonight. Like they've probably been like this. They've been a bad shooting team since the all-star break. So teams have probably felt more comfortable doubling Luca. And then you saw it and then, you know, the Mavericks made 15 threes. Exa makes the game winner. Uh, you know, that's just kind of, you pick your poison with this team. It's, it's just, can, can we point so out hard. before we go to break? I think we need yeah. to talk about one more positive thing that makes no sense to me. Okay. Um, how many shots, you know, the answer to this, but how many shots would you have guessed Gafford and lively missed during this game? <laughs> Uh, is, is it cheating that I already know the answer? It's uh, no, but it, it, I really felt like they were both pretty, pretty bleh on offense. And then you look at the box score and they missed a total of four shots. The, the, <laughs> our, the, the combined Maverick center rotation was eight of 12 from the field for with is, 16 rebounds and four blocks, which feels bad like, <laughs> compared to how they have played for sure. But I mean, they were, yeah, no, they were fine. They were fantastic. Um, I think and, with the, the number, there is not the makes it's the attempts sure um and the those points. were down yeah like gafford scored six points that's the least points he's scored um since the philadelphia game on march 3rd um yeah. so and lively had 12 which is a decent amount but a seven attempts uh like them combining for what so that'd be 18 i think that has to be the least amount they've combined for in a while um and the, and it felt deliberate right yeah. The Kings were taking away the role, man. And I think that's what got the Mavericks gunked up early. Well, and that's what's going to happen. Yes, I mean, that's going to happen in the playoffs. That's it, why the threes they made is is huge. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And sure. and what I've enjoyed seeing is the the pick and roll, you know, understanding Luke is the pick and roll maestro because he's 6'8 and can place the ball in certain places. It's also nice watching other players get involved with the pick and roll with those guys. So. Mm-hmm. All right, we're at 17 minutes. Uh, my turn to shill for a little bit. If you could do us a favor and head down and like the stream, those of you here who are here live, uh, it's it's very appreciated by Josh and myself. Um, if you could also consider subscribing while we're down there, we're, we're inching bit by bit closer to 3,000. Um, it's it's we're like 300 people away, which is a whole lot of people. But uh, every subscription matters to to Josh and I. We would appreciate that. Those of you who are listening on the audio stream, if you could go ahead and uh, leave a review, you know, shoot me an email if you want. Share with your friends. You know, this is a, a community podcast. Um, I think I'll probably do a short uh, secondary live show tonight. I'm already up. Um, I have an early morning and a long weekend ahead, but you know what, what I'll just inject some caffeine into my eyeballs. Uh, so if you guys don't know what post live show we're talking about, just stay on the stream at the end of the, when Josh and I end the show and you'll be able to hang out uh, with me and come up and talk a little basketball. Um, now for those of you listening on the audio version of the show, I'm going to insert some ads. If you could do that, that would be fantastic. And, and we'll be right back. All right, thank you for letting me shill for a minute. So there's there's a couple of other things I think we could could positively talk about. Um, my my favorite was uh, the Maxi Kleber um, absolute like that felt like a turning point in the game. Maxi Kleber's it was a broken play. He hit mm-hmm. a three like, thirty five feet. Uh, looked like twenty twenty one Maxi quite candidly with how the the shot came off his hands, and then he hit another big three. And it's just nice to see some proof of life from Maxi. I mean, can they program his brain so he thinks every three he's taking is with the shot clock running down or the game clock running down? Because I feel like when he gets those catch and shoot opportunities, either at the end of a quarter or end of the game or end of the shot clock, those feel so much. They look better, too. Like he's got more lift. Like it's almost like he's not thinking and he just has to fire. Uh, And there's no hesitation because he can't hesitate or the shot clock's running out like can we do that? Can we like get the matrix to make it seem like that's what it looks like? Cause I feel like he's much better when oh, yeah. <laughs> on the, yeah. on those types of shots. And, and you know, this was, this was just a, a really, it was a really fascinating game. Um, mm-hmm. Coaching staff deserves credit for a lot of this. I don't think we've talked about it very much. Um, just to, we don't need to comment on this very much, but shout out to Jason Kidd for letting it be known through media allies that he would like an extension as next year is the the last year of his contract really loved that right now after the Mavericks have won a lot of games tickled me to pieces um trying to think if like like there's anything else positive that we're really missing uh Ex- Exum you want to talk about that starting oh, like that closing yeah. lineup maybe for a bit what was the who, who's the closing lineup that that we think is sort of their 
the, I don't want to call it the death lineup, but it's it's the it's the clo- it's the group that that they go to 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 take things home. Yeah, it was based the starters with Exum instead of Jones. So Kyrie, Luca, Exum, PJ, uh, Gafford, and you could kind of rotate in Lively if Lively needs to close over Gafford. Like they're they're fairly interchangeable. Um, but yeah, that was it. And it was, I mean, this is what they're gonna have to do in the playoffs. They they the Kings blitz the pick and roll. PJ or Exum was the the release valve, and Exum was either getting wide open threes or PJ was diving into the lane and then creating a wide open three for Exum. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, it's just it it's kind of silly, like because you want to think basketball is more complex than this, but it's make or miss league. Like Exum had three wide open chances. The Mavericks made the right play each time. They ran good offense. Like it wasn't a case of them doing that thing where they don't run a good player they don't get a good shot because the ball gets too stagnant they did they took what the defense gave them made the right read exum had two wide open threes and then a pretty clean layup drive that came off another double team and he missed all three and then he got a fourth chance and and he made it and they won and that's you'll never see a more stark contrast between like what the mavericks need to do down the stretch to win games uh you know than that like that's what it's going to look like when they lose exum missing those shots and then him making that shot, that's what it's going to look like when they win. Because maybe teams do what the, they did to Luka, where they just face guard him, or they just guard him one-on-one, and they don't let these role players get open shots. Maybe that happens more in the playoffs, but I feel like teams are like, I think the way coaches think, I think they're going to double Luka down the stretch, or they're going to double Kyrie in the pick and roll. And they're going to they're gonna see if Exum is actually that good, and he was again tonight. Well, and it's important, I think, to to acknowledge and sort of understand what the coaching staff is up against here because, look, Derek Jones Jr. has been an absolutely incredible signing for the Mavericks for the value. But if things don't work out the way we all want them to this year, that's going to be the one position that I think they're going to try to figure out how to upgrade because you're – for everything that Jones can bring defensively, offensively, he just takes a whole lot off the table. He just does. Uh so you're you can't play, but you also can't play Exum thirty minutes a night. No. You don't want that. That'll break him down. I think over the course of of the season, I wouldn't be surprised if he has some thirty minute nights come playoffs and you see Jones playing, you know, fifteen to right. twenty. Yeah. But that's sort of the balance and 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 things that the Mavericks. You got to get there though. You got to you got to get Exum exactly. healthy, and that's that's the thing. So you got to get there with everybody healthy. And I think the coaching staff's been doing a pretty brilliant job getting all that stuff balanced. Um, and uh, shout out to Paul. Thank you for the tip, Paul. He says, this show makes supporting the Mavs in Ireland for the past five years worthwhile. Luca not forcing anything these last three to four minutes told me all I need to know about this team. That's a great point, Paul. Really appreciate that. Um, but it's, it's that that sort of element of, of what the Mavs are doing right now uh, with with that lineup is very interesting to me. And it's it's just, it's, it's tough uh, because it's there's certain points, and I've talked about this, where uh, at least amongst friends where it's like, man, I really want to see Exum play more. And I just think they got to be judicious with those minutes. So. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, I didn't get to read your recap yet, but we talked about it in Slack. Um, so I'm not sure if you mentioned it yet there, but the Exum and I, and I post about this on Twitter, the Exum game winner was awesome. Like it's awesome to see the Mavericks Keep right. It's a game in that position. Yeah. It is a real uh, game winner. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, and it's it's awesome that they trusted him in that situation and they didn't stick away from it. And Luca didn't take a hero ball shot. Like they just kept kind of trusting the process and it worked out. But the real key to the to the win is like it's it's half and half. Half of it is yes, Exum made that shot, but also the fact that he had the opportunity to make that shot despite missing his previous three. Like if the Mavericks don't play good defense. They, that Exum doesn't have a chance for a game winner because they'd be down maybe five, six, seven points at that opportunity because, you know, you don't, they went, you know, what, three, four possessions in a row scoreless. And so did the Kings because they kind of met them almost every time. The Mavericks never trailed, I don't think, in the final, what, whenever they got no, so the it lead was stuck back. At, it was stuck at 103 for, yeah. for quite a while. And then, um, yeah. And a lot of that was, Exum defensively and and the way that the Mavericks are playing defense. Uh, Darren Fox was two of seven from the floor in the fourth quarter. Uh, he was 0 of one from three. And I think the one, the one three point attempt is, is really important because in the first half, 
He had four three-point attempts in the second half. What did he have? He had three, but only one in the final quarter. Um, like he's a good pull-up three-point shooter now. And I think the way you when you play this kind of drop coverage that the Mavericks play, that opens you up to pull up threes from from capable guards that can hit that shot on you. And what's crucial is you got to have the guy that's guarding the ball handler go over the screen and be able to chase from behind the ball handler to force him inside the three-point line so he's not walking into you know, a rhythm three-point shot, which Fox was doing a little bit more of in the first half. And I thought Exum did a great job making sure that Fox couldn't pull up from three cleanly in the pick and roll, forced him into the paint. And it's, it's a twofer because for one, you're not giving up a pull up three, you know, to a good pull up three point shooter. But also if you can chase him inside the three point line, you're getting him closer to your center who's playing up. So you're getting him closer to help defense. So that just helps you even more. So it's like a combined thing. You're getting the benefit of running him off the three point line. If you're chasing over the screen from behind, and then also you get the benefit of forcing him into your help because that's the whole point of drop, right? Mm-hmm. Is you want to get those contested 15 foot, you know, floater range shots, which are typically inefficient shots if you can contest them well. And I thought Exum uh, did a great job uh, in the final moments, forcing Fox into those tough shots and then the back line holding up strong and then had the opportunity for the game winner. Yep. Quick shout out to, and I'm going to butcher this name. I apologize in advance. I want to say it's uh, Mihalo uh, Nezevich. Hope that's right. It's fans. He he shot us a tip as well. Real or she uh, really appreciate. But I, 95% of our listeners and viewers are men, according to the demographics that we get on on Spotify. <laughs> so I'm just assuming it's a guy. Thank you so so much. Really appreciate these tips, guys. This is wild. I never would have expected anything like this these past two um, past two podcasts. Um, I, I really, PJ, PJ Washington get LASIK. That's sort of my, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to live with this. Like his shots are so bad. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. So bad. <laughs> I don't know what's going he, on. That, there. that three he made to start the third quarter looked nothing like any of his threes in the first half. And then nothing like the ones that came after. I know when he misses, you know, it's a miss before the shots, even halfway through it's arch. <laughs> like mm-hmm. they're not like lined up, like they're just off, but yeah, I don't know. He's got a, they can survive with him shooting the way he's shooting, but in the playoffs, like teams he's are going to get teams are going to treat him like Tony Allen. Like you're, and you made a point. Could you sort of explain what you meant where he's like, like you said the teams are shading him middle. They know he wants to drive to the yes. center from, from the corners. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, I mean, we've talked about before he loves, he loves the floater. Like he's got a nice little push shot in the paint. Goes in. He's been good at, yeah, he's good at it. Um, I feel like teams are starting to get a sense of that now especially now that he's not in Charlotte and I think teams are taking him a little bit more seriously than they do in Charlotte. That's the other thing. Like, it's great that he's in a better environment, but also like he's no longer enjoying the obscurity of being on a crappy team that teams don't prepare as seriously for. Uh So I think he's higher up on the scouting report than he's ever been before. Like teams are paying attention to him because they have to pay attention to Dallas because they're a good team. So I feel like he's, he hasn't been getting that floater off as much recently because I feel like when he catches and teams are closing out on him, they're closing out on him to the middle and they're take trying to take that floater away because that's what he likes to do when he attacks the closeout. So he needs the counter and find like, you know, it kind of goes against basketball reason because you don't you want to go middle. Like usually going middle is what opens everything up when you're when you're driving. But if teams are gonna shade him that hard when they're closing out on him, he has to be able to adjust and go baseline because he might be able to catch a team off guard catch a rotation off guard and either get right. a dunk or get like a little drop off to Gafford or lively force the help rotation, keep the blender going. Cause there were a couple of possessions tonight where he closed out. Someone closed out on him. He drove, tried to go middle and the defender was waiting for him to go middle. And it kind of just, the possession kind of stopped. Yep. Like he didn't, he didn't go anywhere, had to pass it out. And you almost have to reset with like a little time on the shot clock. So I mean, he That'll is now he is now thirty two of one sixteen for from three. That is twenty seven point six percent. He's 
38 percent from the field 27 percent from three in the month of march we need what'd you say he is from the field he's 38 percent from the field we need like 42 percent from the field <laughs> and like 31 percent from three to not die right like fucking like one more like one more shot out of every 10 going down right now it's just he doesn't need to be reggie bullock he no. needs to be not he he needs he's so valuable elsewhere he's yes. just gotta he's just gotta not die on offense right and teams are gonna and they did a little bit tonight like sabonis was guarding him and they put a small on gaffer lively because you don't think that the Mavericks are going to throw the ball into the post to Gafford or Lively to take advantage of the mismatch. Mm -hmm. And then when you've got a smaller player on Gafford or Lively, you can switch the, the, the pick and roll. So you take away the easy lobs or the easy, uh, you know, drop offs in the pick and roll. And then you put a big on, on Washington and you just keeps your big out of the pick and roll because they don't run it as much with Washington. Yep. So they're going to have to counter that. Like a little, you know, that's going to be. I think it's. I, I, and I it's think solvable. it's doable. Yeah. 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 It, it's just he, like, everything sort of grinds to a halt when him and Tim Hardaway aren't hitting any of the shots they're getting, which was the case tonight. Like, Tim is another problem child. Like, he and Washington were three of 17 from the floor. Oh, Tim was so bad. Tim, I mean, Tim's, Tim's shot making choices are getting worse. And I don't understand how. Because his shot making decisions have always been garbage. But it's like when I see him shoot Monta Ellis two pointers, I want to scream. If you're going to take a shitty shot, at least take a long three pointer shitty shot. I know. But at I least mean, the thing with Tim, though, I mean, they've got the, I mean, fans are going to want like no minutes and they're going to want Jaden Hardy. No, to they have, he has That's to never play some happen. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. That at least there's a quick enough hook. Like he only played 20 minutes. How many? I mean, I'm going to look it up right now. I don't think he was good. Like the first quarter, did he play in the fourth quarter? No, he didn't play at all in the fourth quarter. So, like, I get it. Like, he probably shouldn't have played twenty minutes, but like, if he's not playing in the fourth, well, you had to because Kyrie got hurt there in the third, and somebody had to eat some of those minutes while he was while we were figuring out what was up. Yeah, and and fans are going to respond. Well, why isn't that Hardy doing that? But that's just, I don't know. That's not going to. I don't. I don't think kid trusts Hardy right now. I don't either. Shout out to uh, to Chaz in the chat for the tip. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else we need to hit on? When do we? I mean, this is probably the not thirty three minutes into a podcast on a late Saturday night. Mm -hmm. But when do we have the Josh Green conversation? Who? <laughs> exactly. <Who's? laughs> yeah, that might be the conversation. Is that is that the Open and well, why don't you why don't you share have you did you write on that i, I can't remember i'm about to i'm gonna get something done this weekend and i don't want to then i don't want to throw it out there but let's oh. just say that that the josh of it all with how dallas has been winning um sorry if you can hear the baby crying in the background i'm gonna have to go take care of him oh yeah let's wrap it up. um that's okay we, we we're doing a sleep training method where we don't bother him for at least 15 minutes um we know guys we know josh green is out we're talking about when he comes back like I don't think he fits. Like if, if you're shortening to an eight man rotation, I don't really think you, you play it's so, you know, that's, a, that's the thing. Um, yeah, I think we're kind of done here. I mean, the Mavericks play, we got to, let's just look at the schedule real quick. Cause the schedule was, was something of, of note to me that I was interested in. They play Sunday afternoon. Well, late early evening at, uh, at the Rockets. Then they play uh, for their fifth straight home or fifth straight road game on Tuesday against Golden State late. Um, if they can walk away with this road trip with five straight wins, that's just absolutely astounding. Um, yeah, I mean the the rest of their the the, the rest of this this uh, season's games um, are all trap games. Every single one of them is a trap game, and like guys, they really they need some help, but. <laughs> They can keep climbing. They can. They it's really so, can. It's so bizarre that they're winning all these games and it's like they're barely scratching out of the play-in. <sighs> so like they they can both like finish maybe fourth, but if they lose like two out of three in these next couple of games, mm -hmm. they could be right back to eighth. Well, like, the Clippers the way everyone else is, uh, else is playing. The Clippers have righted their ship a little bit. Because they, they defeated the Magic by they defeated the Magic and the Sixers in a pair of literal coin flip games. Like the the Sixers game, the the 
they stole Kawhi Leonard fouled um, Kelly Oubre. And then tonight they beat the magic. So, and then they play the Hornets and they play the Kings nuggets. And so it's like, they're, then they play a pair of games against the, the Suns. It's like there, there's some interesting stuff going down the stretch. Like the Mavericks really have an opportunity. They just need to keep doing what they can do uh, and to, and win the games they're supposed to win. I just I'm sort of I'm sort of curious just because I think that there's going to be the temptation to to not temptation. Like I think they're going to have to have a serious discussion about whether they need to sit Luca for a game or two just so he can heal up a little bit. And I I just yeah I mean Luca. I, I, He's, Luka, he's, a, he's the engine. Yeah. Luca didn't take a shot in the restricted area tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Which they played him sh- great. The Kings yeah. played him great. Like, there's no other way around it. I like Murray. Murray's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In the, yeah, they played him a lot. Yeah. All right. Rockets, by the way, have won 11 in a row. So that's not going to be an easy game. And they're really good at home. So that might be, I'll just say, that's going to be the hardest game they have on their schedule to before that they've got left is this Sunday game against the Rockets. So if they win that game, if the Mavericks win that game, I don't know, like everyone can start make whatever wild over the top predictions. Well, you and make. I don't, the Rockets terrify me because they've won like 11 games in a row now or yep. something. Yeah. 11 in a row. I do not like, that's just, that's just scary. I'm in Thompson, um, your boy. He's playing a lot. He's awesome. Like they're, mm-hmm. they're rolling. All right, guys. Um, I don't think I'm going to do a live show now just because I think I should probably go take care of the baby. Okay. Um, thanks so much for hanging out. This has been fun. Josh and I will be back on Sunday afternoon or, e- or early evening, probably for an earlier podcast. I'll try to do a show then. Um, we'll see, though, because then I'll have to, to I'll be doing a baby feed because I am going to be by myself this weekend. Um, all right, guys. Thanks so much for hanging out. Thanks for the tips, everyone. Uh, please, uh, again, leave comments on the show. If you're if you're watching on the YouTube later, um, send us emails, t- tweets. I at least check my Twitter. Sometimes Josh doesn't, which is probably the smart thing to do. Uh, this has been Kirk Henderson and Josh Bowe. Um, everybody be good and go Mavs.